It turns out that because of my activities, I deal with engineers probably more than any other type of discipline, uh, not only within the agency, but within the interagency of the U.S. government and internationally. And someday, if my granddaughter decides to marry an engineer, I'll probably give her my blessing. <laughs> All right. Um, this will automatically go. Prior to Sputnik 1, there was only one known object in orbit about the Earth, and that, of course, was the moon. Since then, we've gotten quite a bit of man-made debris. It turns out that throughout the past 50 years, the percent of operational objects in Earth orbit is about 5%. It's, it's maintained that pretty regularly up until the last few years. One of the challenges I do not have is that when I show this series of slides, at the end, everybody agrees there is a space pollution problem. It's not like climate change where there's still debate whether you, you know, think it's a legitimate debate or not. There is, a leg there is an actual debate, and you have to convince people. This pretty much convinces them all by itself. So these are all objects which are larger than 10 centimeters, which are being tracked on a regular basis by the U.S. Space Surveillance Network. Um, I do have to make a caveat. For obvious reasons, the dots are not to scale to the Earth. Okay? And when I first started putting these charts together about 30 years ago, um, I picked the size of the spot to be a little bit bigger than the classic little dot you get on a bad Xerox in the old days. Um, but what this does, so it, it looks like it's more congested than it really is. Space is a big place, and even though there are lots of particles out there in the millions, spatial density, number of pieces per cubic kilometer, is still very, very low. I mean, we don't lose operational spacecraft very often, with the exception this year, um, to space debris, which is, which is a good thing. But these kind of graphics are useful in looking at the areas of concentration and the, um, the trends that we see. Uh, this is one of my favorite cartoons on orbital debris. You know you've made the big time if Frank and Ernest talk about your discipline. The other interesting aspect is this cartoon actually is over 25 years old. Space debris, orbital debris, has been in the public consciousness for a long time. Um, it's obviously not something they, they worry about on a daily basis, but when certain events happen, like the satellite collision in February of this year, then people pop up and say, oh yeah, I knew something about that. So what is orbital debris? It's a pretty simple definition. It's anything which is not useful and in Earth orbit. So that means derelict spacecraft, it means orbital stages for launch vehicles, and it means lots of fragmentation debris and things which we intentionally threw off a spacecraft, be it during human spaceflight or be it during um, robotic operations. Some of this debris, some of the stages are up to eight metric tons uh, apiece. Some of these debris, of course, are you know, less than uh, uh, a gram. So we have to worry about that. This is a history of the official catalog that the U.S. maintains of objects in space. So this is sort of a graphical synopsis of those pictures you saw at the very beginning. Uh, and we've broken them out into rocket bodies, payloads, mission-related debris, things we, we threw off intentionally, and then fragmentation debris. And fragmentation debris has always been the, the largest share of the overall population. And We've had two major events since 2007. The Chinese conducted an anti-satellite test, which instantaneously uh, contributed over 3,000 large objects, 3,000 objects larger than 10 centimeters. So a dramatic, dramatic jump in the population, which we had been building over 50 years, and all of a sudden we had this great step function. And then the accidental collision between an Iridium spacecraft and a Cosmos spacecraft in February of this year, which instantaneously created about 2,000 large objects. So the, the, just very briefly, the um, conditions, the, the background for that collision, uh, it occurred in February of this year at an altitude about 790 kilometers. That was not an accident. Uh, 790 kilometers, 800 kilometers is like the second highest concentration of tracked objects or objects in general in orbit about the Earth. So if you're looking for an accidental collision, 
you know, statistically they're going to happen where you have the most objects. And it finally did happen. Uh, we've actually had accidental collisions prior to this, but never between two large intact objects. The accidental collisions we've had prior were between a small object and a large object, a spacecraft or a rocket body, and very little debris was produced. In this case, both of the spacecraft were substantially destroyed in terms of numbers of pieces, um, and we're still counting. I mean, this chart says 1,700. It's getting close to 2,000, and those are just the big things. The smallest debris, of course, goes up exponentially. Uh, we've already, uh, NASA's already had to do one collision avoidance maneuver with one of our robotic spacecraft because of debris from this collision. Uh, actually, just a couple of weeks ago, we were preparing to maneuver the International Space Station away from debris from this collision. Uh, but the last few hours before we executed that maneuver, we decided, well, it wasn't going to come quite so close, and it did not meet our risk threshold for actually conducting the maneuver, so we, we stood down. Um, Debris is dynamic, just like the environment itself, in that it doesn't stay in one place. Initially, what you have, when you have a collision anyway, you have two distinct clouds. It just turns out that these two vehicles, when they hit, were almost in perpendicular orbits. Uh, had a collision velocity of nearly 11 kilometers per second, which is why you have so much energy and why you have so many pieces. But the perturbations in orbit spread that debris out because of the, the non-uniform uh, uh, nature of the gravitational field, because they're in different uh, orbits, uh, different orbital periods, different energies. And so they start to spread out. And this is just a depiction of what it's going to look like in February of next year. Uh, the cosmos debris spreads out a little bit quicker because it's in a a lower inclination orbit, so the perturbations are greater, and the, the green debris is the iridium satellite, and it takes just a little bit longer to spread out. But what you see basically is a, a ball of twine, uh, and so the debris is everywhere. Uh, so it only remains concentrated for a very short period of time. Now, how do we know what's up there? Well, as I said, the, the U.S. Space Surveillance Network tracks the large things. We have a cooperative agreement with DOD. They characterize the large debris... In Using Goldstone, we can see down to about two to three millimeters. Now, we can't track them, but we can detect them. We can figure out how, how big they are. We can figure out what inclination they're in. Uh, we know what their altitude is. And that then allows us to prepare a statistical assessment of what the population is. And by doing this every year, we get an idea of the trend, how the uh, population is evolving. And then for things smaller than about a millimeter, then we have to rely on the examination of return surfaces. Uh, whenever the shuttle comes back, we do an extensive survey to see what kind of damage it has incurred. Even though the shuttle and International Space Station fly at the, the very lowest parts of low Earth orbit, uh, where the spatial density, where the debris is less, I mean, that's the, the pristine part of space is where the shuttle and the station fly. Uh, it's much, much worse at higher altitudes. Here are some, uh, let, me go, let me go back. Uh, um, I also have superimposed here, you know, damage levels. These things, collision velocities, again, are on average about 10 kilometers per second. It can be a little bit more, a little bit less. So a lot of energy involved. Small particles can inflict great damage. Uh, we first figured out that we had a problem uh, on one of the early shuttle missions when we came back and had a pit in the window. And we analyzed that pit and found out it got hit by a fleck of paint. And you think about it, every spacecraft and every launch vehicle upper stage is typically painted for thermal reasons. And you know what happens to your house paint after about 10 years. So there's a sea of paint particles up there. Now, fortunately, these are typically you know, much less than a millimeter in size. Um, and they don't pose a real serious threat to virtually all vehicles. The shuttle, however, is very special. Uh, we reuse the, the vehicle, of course, and so if there's an imperfection in the outer pane of one of the cockpit windows, then we have to replace it before we fly again because the launch stress is what might uh, propagate that imperfection. But in general, um, every spacecraft is vulnerable, particularly robotic spacecraft, which is the the primary concern, I think, of most people in this room uh, are vulnerable to five millimeter particles. Uh, 
we can only protect up to about one centimeter size particles. These are some uh, cases of impacts on the International Space Station. Actually, the upper left is the largest impact we've had on the station. Uh, fortunately, it hit an area of a Russian module that had substantial thermal blankets. It penetrated the thermal blankets. Uh, if it hit another part, it could have gone through a pressure wall. Um, but we have uh, a quite a bit of, um, of, of actual debris shields on the station. I'll show you about that in just a second. Uh, this is uh, one of the multi-purpose logistic modules which fly to the station only for about you know uh, uh, 10 days or, or up to two weeks during a shuttle mission and is brought back right away. And during one of the flights, one of the early flights actually, we had a penetration. Uh, but it's a double wall, so there was no problem in terms of the, um, the, the safety of that particular module of the crew. Uh, as I said, we investigate the uh, shuttle uh, after every flight. Uh, this is a, one of those impacts on the window blown up. Uh, this is a hole in the radiator, you know, the big, large aluminum uh, structures inside the cargo bay doors. Uh, great witness plate for me, um, but it's uh, a, a risk to the shuttle because, as you might imagine, it's a radiator. There are tubes underneath those sheets of aluminum, and if you penetrate a tube, you have a, a substantial effect on the thermal control capability of the vehicle. All right, NASA has pioneered this whole area of orbital debris, um, and we started putting out specific, what originally were guidelines in 1995, they're now called requirements. Um, actually, today is the 30th anniversary of the establishment of the NASA Orbital Debris Program Office, uh, beginning of the fiscal year of 1980. Uh, and we have a system set up as a relatively uh, formal system that every single project and program within NASA that's going to fly in space has to prepare what's called an orbital debris assessment report. And it's first submitted at PDR and then again at CDR and actually now it's a living document. You have to maintain it. Um, and then I have the privilege of reviewing every single one of them to gauge whether or not it's compliant with the requirements that we have. Um, there are also special risk assessments performed for the shuttle before every mission. There are certain requirements, uh, maximum risk, which we allow in terms of loss of crew and vehicle, in terms of maybe having to terminate the mission early because the radiator got penetrated. Um, and when there is a fragmentation event, uh, because as you saw from the earlier press, uh, illustration, debris goes all altitudes. And so there could be an explosion at 600 kilometers that can affect the International Space Station down at 350 kilometers. And I've gotten many calls at 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning saying, from DOD saying, we just noticed an explosion, and then we have to go back and quickly, real time, do an assessment to make sure that that particular event does not pose an undue risk to human space flight or even some of our more valuable robotic spacecraft. And then uh, finally, the ISS, I said we have substantial dedicated shields on station. If you remember, there was a chart yesterday that said at mission complete, the mass of the International Space Station will be 400 metric tons, and a little bit more than that. 5% of that is dedicated shielding. And you think about how much it costs to put a kilogram in space. Look at the cost then that we've had to incur just for orbital debris to be able to maintain the International Space Station. All right, we've got very good top level support. There have been two interagency, um, U.S. government interagency documents on orbital debris in 1989 and then in 1995. The President's national space policy has mentioned orbital debris mitigation since President Reagan in 1988. Uh, the current national space policy came out in August of 2006, and if you get these charts later on, you can read this or you can download it from our website. Uh, this is verbatim what it says. Basically, it says that, you know, orbital debris poses a risk to operations in space, and it poses a risk to people in space and on the ground. And I'll talk about the ground part here in just a minute. And then we developed, as a result of the 1995 direction from the White House, 
DOD and NASA were tasked to go out and develop what we, were, what we call the United States Government Orbital Debris Standard Practices. These are the things you should be doing in the design and operation and disposal of your vehicles, including spacecraft and launch vehicles. Um, and then the last part, which is also important, it says the United States shall take a leadership role in international forum, and we have been doing that. We created, under the auspices of the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House, a multi-year strategy for handling orbital debris. We did this in the late 90s, and we just signed off, completed every part of it in 2007. And it said, first, get our own act together. Uh, there were differences between NASA and DOD and the other agencies really weren't even thinking about orbital debris. So we first we came up with these standard practices. We then took those standard practices to the what's called the Interagency Space Debris Coordination Committee, which is an organization of the 11 major spacefaring agencies of the world. You have to be an agency to be a member. NASA is the U.S. representative. I'm the head of the, the NASA delegation to IEDC, but my delegation includes DOD, it includes state, it includes the FCC, because they're all players in space operations. We went to the IEDC, convinced them, and developed the first international guidelines on oral debris mitigation, and then the last step was to go to the United Nations, and we did that and were very successful. So what are the um, debris mitigation guidelines? Uh, they're very uh, general and straightforward. Uh, you don't want to create debris unnecessarily. Uh, in the past, we actually had been doing that. Uh, like in many cases, you, you create uh, pollution sometimes without thinking about the consequences. Um, minimize debris generated by accidents. The vast majority of debris, which is a hazard to space operations, comes from accidents. Um, then we will worry about, say, flight profiles of how you design your vehicle, what altitude you fly at, and then what do you do with, do with it at the end? It turns out that is probably the most crucial element of this whole problem. Um, and then, so in 2002, we were able to get the IDC to put together these debris guidelines. The, as I said, there are 11 members of the IDC. It's a consensus organization which means every single member has to agree to these guidelines before they be developed, and that, that's quite a bit. But if you really want to challenge, work in the United Nations. I've been the U.S. technical expert at the U.N. for 13 years, and you're sitting in a room with 70-plus members, and it's a consensus organization, and every single country sitting in the room has to agree with it in the, all the major official languages of the U.N., and every single word is up for debate and negotiation. Um, but all that being said, in 2007, the United Nations did approve the space debris mitigation guidelines. And they're now out to everybody in the world. Uh, you can see them from the NASA website. And they're almost verbatim from what we had before, but, you know, you always some of the words are a little bit different. All right, so green engineering orbital debris. Um, Green engineering um, is really not a term we use in my discipline. Um, in fact, my first connection with green engineering was 40 years ago when I was an avionics technician in the Air Force, and we had a motto in, in there that, you know, if it moved, you safety wired it, you know, so it wouldn't come out during flight, and if it didn't move, you painted it green so it wouldn't rust. And so when I was on the flight line, I had a can of spray green paint to paint things, but this is sort of a different connotation now. Um, initially, of course, in the 60s, you know, we were just happy to get into orbit. You know, <laughs> that, that was a challenge. Um, so we would throw things off intentionally. Springs, um, we'd have explosive bolts. We didn't care where the pieces of the explosive bolts went. Uh, we had covers for sensors, particularly cameras and, and attitude control sensors. We'd just throw them away, and we didn't think too much of it. And Gradually, as you saw from the very early graph, that slowly accumulates in terms of the number of objects still in orbit. So now most missions are debris-free by design. Uh, it's taken a long time to convince uh, the aerospace engineers developing launch vehicle spacecraft that this really is in their own best interest so that we can maintain space operations. The, the term that uh, is 
come into vogue even in my area is sustainability of space operations. It was actually a, a, a term uh, coined by the chairman of the Technical and Scientific Subcommittee of Copuis in the UN, uh, Gerard Brochet from France when he was the chairman. And it's the theme of the International Astronautical Congress, which convenes about 10 days from now in South Korea. This is very important to the international aerospace community. Um, if we see um, events which uh, produce debris, then we now tackle them immediately. Um, the Delta IV launch vehicle is relatively new. Uh, the Japanese developed uh, the H-2A uh, several years ago. When they first started to fly, they were producing debris which was not expected. And so in both cases, the U.S. and Japan immediately tackled that, said, what's going on? We need to stop this. And um, Japanese have been successful, and the U.S. is still working on Delta IV, but uh, I, I think it's getting better. All right, spacecraft in orbital stages have to be passivated at the end of mission. Passivation simply means get rid of all the stored energy. You know, we don't always know why a spacecraft or a launch vehicle blows up, but there have been over 200 fragmentations reported uh, since 1961. The vast majority uh, were accidental explosions, uh, over 140 from vehicles which had successfully completed their missions. They were spacecraft or they were launch vehicles that did exactly what you asked them to do and then you left them on their own when you turned them off. And then spontaneously, a day later, sometimes 25 years later, they did blew up into hundreds of large pieces and many, many more smaller pieces. The reasons, of course, are varied depending upon the design. It's not always propellants. It can be pressurants. It can be batteries. But we finally decided, you know, let's just get rid of all the energy, and then this can't happen. And we basically have been 100% successful. Once you passivate a vehicle, it just doesn't have the possibility of blowing up. And this has been one of the great success stories, actually. Um, and when we go to designers of launch vehicles and spacecraft, they say, oh, yeah, well, that makes sense. In almost all cases, it's very, very easy to fix the problem. You vent the pressure in you turn the engine back on and burn off all the propellants or you vent the propellants, it's really not that big of a deal. And so we get actually very good compliance on the launch vehicle side. Uh, a little bit more of a challenge on the spacecraft side, classic you know, cultural phenomenon. We've been building spacecraft like this for decades. You know, why should I change? Well, you know, we have seat belts in cars now. And we have catalytic converters, which we never used to have but there's a reason for them, and eventually, you know, we're getting there. You know, one of the things, that when we first started out, we said, look, you don't have to go back and retrofit series spacecraft, but if you have a de novo design, here's your chance. You know, start with a clean sheet of paper, let's do it right, and we're, we're making good progress. Um, reduce the potential for future accidental collisions um, because they create debris. So one of the ways to do it is to get rid of these guys, and so NASA came up with a metric, uh, a, a, a criteria that says when you're done with your launch vehicle or your, your spacecraft in low Earth orbit, make sure that somehow it's gone within 25 years. Uh, typically what you do, you know, if you're uh, below 600 kilometers, it'll happen naturally. Mother Nature will take care of you. Uh, if you're above 600 kilometers, you need to probably bring your vehicle back down to a lower altitude. And then within 25 years, Mother Nature again will take care of it. Um, this was a good thing, um, and it does prevent the growth of a lot of mass in orbit because mass is the, the, the metric that we're concerned about because where there's mass, because of collisions, there will be more debris. The less mass, the less future debris. Um, in geosynchronous orbit, uh, you know, obviously, you can't come down out of the environment, so you just want to get away from that very valuable and unique uh, resource, uh, the geostationary orbit. So we say just go up like 200 kilometers and stay away. Uh, you do have to worry about perturbations, make sure you don't automatically wind up coming back after some period of time. And it only takes like 10 kilograms of propellant to do that at that altitude. So this is not a, a real serious problem. And Spacecraft operators in GEO have been doing this now uh, since the 70s. Uh, we have relatively good compliance uh, internationally. 
Not complete, but you know, we're working on doing a better job. All right. In Leo, though, we're encouraging operators to get rid of their vehicles in 25 years. Well, where are they going? They're coming back to Earth. So what we're doing is we're taking a on-orbit risk and we're transferring it into an on-the-ground risk. Because particularly if you have a vehicle that weighs more than a few hundred kilograms, almost always there will be components of those vehicles which survive reentry. You know, this, this notion that everything burns up on reentry just is not true. Um, practically any spacecraft or launch vehicle will have components. Some many components, some very large components. You saw a picture yesterday of a big tank that came down in Georgetown, Texas, just north of Austin, with a woman bending over it. Well, I took that picture. Uh, that was a uh, TV reporter. Uh, what you didn't see, because of the angle that I selected, all you saw was a, a farmhouse in the far distance. Well, if I turned about 90 degrees and took the picture, you'd see a farmhouse was like about 100 meters away. Um, and, and this farmer and his wife went to bed that night. There was nothing in their front yard, and during the middle of the night, this thing comes crashing down. Um, so there is a risk, and we recognize that risk. And the bottom line here at the end is that uh, we have adopted in the U.S. and is gradually taking international acceptance uh, a criterion that says the reentry risk from any object should be no greater than 1 in 10,000. Uh, if it is, then you probably need to do a controlled deorbit. Uh, mentioned yesterday, logistical vehicles in the International Space Station are typically uh, dropped into the Pacific. In fact, there was a Progress spacecraft just earlier this week that was dropped into the Pacific Ocean. When the time comes, the entire International Space Station will be dropped into the Pacific Ocean. Hopefully, you know, after 2020, however long we can maintain it. But we, before we started bending metal on the International Space Station, we were thinking about, oh my God, how do we get rid of it? It's 400 metric tons. You can't let that thing come back by itself. You know you have to put it in the ocean, just like the Russians did with Mir and the previous um, space station. How do you move 400 metric tons and put it right where you want it? Well, this is a work in progress. We, are, we, uh, we don't really have all the answers, but we, we kind of know how we might get away with it. Um, as you remember, in, in May, uh, the shuttle went up to supposedly the last servicing mission for the Hubble Space Telescope, and people would say, well, that's the last time we're ever going to visit the Hubble Space Telescope. Not true. Uh, NASA is committed to doing a controlled deorbit of Hubble because it weighs so much, it has so much mass, that its risk to people on the ground is too great that we can't let it come in uncontrolled anywhere in the world. So at some point, probably in the next end of the next decade, uh, we will go back and visit HST, either robotically or with CEV or with something, uh, attach a deorbit motor and drop it into the Pacific. Um, we, because of this, we at NASA, and particularly at Goddard, give them credit, uh, have a program called Design to Demise. Uh, and it kind of what it says. What you'd like to do is build your spacecraft out of materials which don't survive reentry, which means you don't want to use high melting temperature materials like titanium, beryllium, stainless steel, materials that actually we've been using in spacecraft and launch vehicles for many, many, many years. Uh, and we, we chose them for convenience, and sometimes we chose them because they had specific material properties which we felt were essential. Uh, particularly in the payloads. Payloads um, sometimes are the hardest ones to retrofit um, because the unique properties, you need coefficient of expansion and everything that you have to worry about. But what we're trying to do is replace those high melting temperature materials with lower melting temperature materials like aluminum. Uh, I'm sure you remember in January and February of last year, uh, the United States Department of Defense had a spacecraft called USA-193 which had malfunctioned, contained hundreds of kilograms of hydrazine, and was about to re-enter in an uncontrolled manner because they had lost control right after launch. Um, the problem we had was that all that hydrazine was in a very large titanium tank. 
And titanium tanks typically we enter very, very well <laughs> and in one piece. Uh, we actually, my office, we do we entry analysis for every NASA vehicle, but we always look at them as if they were empty because the earlier guideline says you're going to passivate the vehicle, so you've already gotten rid of all those propellants. We had actually never worried about a failure scenario in which we had a full hydrazine tank, and DOD hadn't either. And so I, I was the NASA representative on an international uh, interagency uh, group that the president charged with trying to neutralize this threat. And as you well know, we, we were able to negate that threat by blowing the thing up just before it reentered. Um, but that's not an action that we normally want to take. And as it turns out, not very well known, certainly not to the public, uh, a few months after that activity to negate that particular threat, um, NASA launched the GLASS satellite that contained several hundred kilograms of hydrazine in a titanium tank. Um, and if GLASS had, or actually if, to, if it were to fail today, we would have a very similar problem. We would have a tank with frozen hydrazine, which would be eventually coming back to because it's relatively low altitude. Um, so we're now looking at ways to prevent that, and Goddard has already done this. Um, they've now designed a tank for hydrazine, which is not titanium, and it will demise. So the tr trick here is to come up with better materials. In this case, better is lower melting temperature. But it's a, a tremendous, um, again, culture change for the aerospace industry, and you really have to work very hard to convince them that this is something that really is necessary. It, it costs a little bit to design this, but now that you designed it, you know, that cost is gone, and it's just as easy to build an aluminum tank than it is a titanium tank. Um, all right, what's, what's the, the long term? Uh, uh, we have known for actually 30 years plus that the real long-term problem are objects running at each other, just like we saw in February. We knew that was going to happen. Can't tell you when it was going to happen. Uh, I'm not Gene Dixon. You know, I can't foresee the future. But we knew that was going to I mean, statistically, it's inevitable. And so uh, a colleague and I had an article in Science in January 2006 that basically was taking a new look at the problem. We said, beginning of 2006, nobody in the world ever launches another object into space. All we have is what's up there. What's going to happen to the debris population? Well, you initially have decay of, of, of fragments, the decay of intact objects, but, you know, low-hanging fruit, you know, uh, it's exponential in terms of longevity once you go to higher altitudes. So after uh, you get rid of the low-altitude stuff below 600 kilometers, everything else is up there for many, many decades and hundreds and thousands of years. And so what happens is you start having these random collisions. And within about 40 or 50 years, you actually start having a net increase in population just because you're creating debris quicker than it's falling out of the environment. Well, that was optimistic for many reasons. One is we assumed nobody was doing any launches. Nobody was doing anti-satellite tests. There were no more accidents going on. So here's a chart we put together uh, just actually a few weeks ago, brand new off, off the press, hasn't been shown by any, seen by anybody. The biggest problem is when we did the earlier study, we were down here. But already we have the problem that we have a lot more debris up there than we did three years ago because of the Chinese test and the accident in February of this year. And then we go through a bunch of scenarios that say, what if you did absolutely nothing at all? And, of course, that's the worst case, and that's the top line. And then what if you um, kind of ignore what you're doing today, but you make a commitment to start pulling big things out of orbit? How will that affect the environment? And that's what these three curves are right here. And then if, what we really want to do is continue to be compliant with the guidelines uh, that are out there today, both nationally and internationally. And in addition to that, that alone won't prevent the growth of the space of the debris environment. So we have to start thinking about actively removing large objects from Earth orbit. That is the long-term problem. Now, we do have an advantage that, you know, the climate um, change community doesn't have. 
you know, there's a perception, uh, perhaps a reality, that climate change is something which is coming very quickly in a relative sense. This problem is much, much longer. I mean, it's still exponential, like so many things are in nature, but it's got a long time constant. Uh, this is a 100-year scenario. In a worst-case scenario, if I did nothing, worst case, you know, what, the environment doubles in 100 years. Well, and it, this is not what you typically read in the paper or, or the science fiction magazines where all of a sudden you can no longer use Earth orbit. You can't fly a weather satellite or a navigation satellite or a human piloted satellite because it's too dangerous. That would happen, but we're now talking eons you know, down the road. Um, so we do have time to do this. We don't have to worry about doing it over the next five or 10 or even 15 years. Now, finally, I do have what I think are some worthwhile lessons learned that perhaps have application uh, in your individual uh, areas where you're more concerned about terrestrial pollution. Um, again, obviously, we'll, we, in the long term, we, we have to worry about green engineering in space. Um, the United States and the international community have already been very proactive. This is one of those relatively rare areas of pollution where we recognized the issue before it was a problem. We knew this was going to eventually happen, and we're tackling it earlier. So the, actually, the last 20 years, when we're going out preaching the gospel of space debris mitigation, uh, we have not worried so much about the longer term. We're trying to educate people, saying there are some simple things you can do right now which will have a dramatic uh, impact, a positive impact, on the future environment, and that's what we've been pushing. How we did that and why we were successful is NASA put in a lot of resources, and Lewis can attest to this, to make sure we understood the problem. And then we took that message out to the technical community because those are the people that have to respond to it. And then we also had to develop effective and acceptable policies and guidelines. You know, if I say, you know, you can't ever use titanium again in a spacecraft. Well, you know, you just sort of turn me off. You know, so we worked with the aerospace engineers uh, to find solutions. You know, if I tell you you have to deorbit from geosynchronous orbit, you know, that's a non-starter as well. So you have to find things that work. And uh, at least we've been fortunate in our community, there are some very helpful activities and design uh, uh, processes that will do that. The other thing we did, we also worked very closely with the international community. This is not a U.S. only problem. You know, we can't fix it, and we're not responsible for all of it. Now, we, you know, we have our share of, of uh, responsibility in terms of debris up there, uh, but the Russians and the Chinese are about equal with us right now. Um, but it's an international issue, so what we want to do is make sure that when we put in place these guidelines that they are accepted internationally so that our industry is not put at an economic disadvantage. Um, and so ESA certainly has been on board with this from the very early days. In fact, the, the very first organization that NASA went to to discuss this on a bilateral uh, uh, level was with ESA and got very, very good uh, re reaction. Um, in the long term, remediation of the environment is really what we need to do. And, and that's a term that we actually have not been using much until the last several years. Uh, again, we don't think it's urgent, but clearly since the February event, um, a lot of people are talking about remediation. Uh, the problem is we don't know how to do it. Um, it's either technically uh, impossible depending upon your concept, your, your technique, or we can't afford it. And so you have to find something that will meet both of those criteria. And I've been thinking about this for a long, long, long time and still haven't found anything. And, and since February, we've been getting a lot of unsolicited suggestions of, of how to clean up the environment. And uh, in December, DARPA and NASA are co-sponsoring an international conference in the Washington area uh, on orbital debris removal. Um, you know, if we knew how to do it, we wouldn't have a conference. We wouldn't ask people to come in and give us good ideas. I've seen a lot of good ideas from some smart people and some uh, lay public people. 
Um, but we're still struggling. We can't find anything which is good either for the small debris environment or for the large debris environment. Um, but, you know, as time goes on, as technology improves, if the economics of space transportation ever come down and improve, uh, you know, some of these things may now look a little bit more attractive than they do before. So if there are any other questions left, we're back on schedule.